Welcome to AGRI 635 Integrated Forage Management. Today this is a presentation on irrigation ponds and I bring this information to you in my year-round greenhouse where I have a small man-made pond and we are going to discuss this pond as well as larger ponds when we go through the information and for those of you that are in the master's program for agricultural science uh, definitely know that this information is testable. For those of you who are just watching it for fun, go ahead and crack open a bottle of beer or pour yourself a glass of wine, whatever your choice beverage is, and sit back and just enjoy the information. So I chose irrigation ponds for my presentation because one, I have a small irrigation pond that I use to water my citrus trees. I currently live in the hardiness zone 7A. Sometimes it drops into 6B and 6A, and as we move into the solar minimum that we're heading into now, it is going to drop into that for the next 11, 12 years. We go in through these cycles, solar minimum, solar maximums. We just started exiting the solar maximum, and now we're entering the solar minimum, which means it's going to be colder, not only during the summer, but also during the winter. As the earth moves just a little bit further away from the sun, we experience these climate changes based on the, the Earth's orbit around the sun. And because of that, we need to adjust uh, how we farm and how we manage our livestock. So these are the things that we think about when we're looking at how do we irrigate our crops? How do we take care of our animals? How do we provide them with water? So Idaho being a high desert, we only get a total of about eight inches of rain every year that's not enough to water our crops. So we definitely need to take into consideration other options available to us. With Idaho being a high desert, we can water our crops through uh, underground aquifers. Uh, that's one of the things that we do have in our local area. We can also use surface water, which is lakes, streams, rivers, other ponds, other and be able to draw from that in order to irrigate our crops. Now, in Idaho, we have regulations that prohibit the use of aquifers for filling ponds. That is absolutely prohibited, can't do it. We can only use surface water to fill our ponds. So there are different types of ponds that you can construct. We're going to talk about the different ways of constructing those ponds. And in that construction process, how to seal your pond. There are multiple ways of being able to seal your pond. Sometimes you want seepage, sometimes you do not. So we'll, we'll go over how to do that. And then once you have your pond built, you want to definitely maintain that pond because you've put a lot of time, effort, and money, all of your resources into building this pond. You want to make sure that it is available every year for your crop and livestock needs. So we're gonna definitely need to maintain that every single year. And then we're gonna talk about the different uh, other options for the pond. Because an irrigation pond can do more than just irrigate crops or water your livestock. And we're gonna talk about those because they're very fascinating, I think, types of ponds. So most people, when you say pond, they'll think of a body of water that you can walk around. Sometimes there's a little inlet stream or an outlet stream but it is a body of water that you can walk up to, you can get into, you can see from the air, and you can actually see it when you walk up to it. But that's not the only type of ponds there are. Sometimes ponds are not visible. By the end of this presentation, you're gonna be able to explain the different types of ponds that we have, visible and invisible. How to use them, where to use them, how to install them, and then decide whether you want to construct one on your farm or ranch or not. Types of ponds. We have the above ground that we just talked about. Everybody knows what a pond is. But did you know there are invisible ponds? These are ponds that when you walk up to, you would never know that they're there. Most of the time, these ponds are constructed in areas where regulation prohibits the construction of a pond. Highly regulated. The invisible pond is one that you don't see. You can walk up on it and never know it's there. You can walk on it, drive on it, and you would never even know. This is a type of pond that is usually constructed in areas where it would be illegal to build a pond otherwise. 
These ponds will store water uh, in smaller quantities and have that water accessible for smaller acreages, smaller types of farms. So if you're not a large farm and you're wanting something in an area that you normally would not be able to build a pond in, an invisible pond is an option to you. This kind of pond takes a little bit more construction for it. So with that pond, um, you do have to pump it. You can't just uh, slowly drain it. Those types of ponds are below the ground level and usually those are not able to be used as gravity fed for irrigating crops. Those are ones that you would have to actually put a pump into. It functions a whole lot like an underground aquifer. Other than you've built it, you can line it so there's no seepage or no leakage. You can um, build it as big as you want or as small as you want, depending on how much water you need for irrigation for your small farm. So this type of pond, the invisible pond, this is going to be the last mention of it because it is more technical and more in depth in order to be able to create one of those. That in and of itself would require an entire class time in order to learn about that. So we're not going to mention that again today. So the typical type of pond that most people think about is the above ground one that you can walk up and see. This can be seen from the air, it can be seen from the ground, you can see it from far off. The pond is surrounded by land and sometimes they have an inlet or an outlet source of water. So with your pond you need to decide do you want seepage or do you want no seepage? And each one has its place, each one has its own positives and negatives, pros and cons, in developing these types of ponds. If you decide to have a pond that is not going to have any seepage, you will have to line it. These liners can be expensive, the installation can be expensive, and then the maintenance can also be time consuming and expensive. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the types of ponds, if you want to have seepage or no seepage. Now with the seepage ponds, there is a level of construction that has to take place before you can ever use this pond. And that does take a lot more time. So while the pond liner installation can take some time, sealing a seepage pond can take a whole lot longer. So take that into consideration when you are deciding uh, is time more worth it or is money more worth it. With the seepage ponds, you're going to need a biotic slime. I know, that sounds gross. But hear me out. <laughs> We've been doing this for a long time. Nature has been doing this for a long time. This biotic slime is totally natural in the world. It's what creates ponds and lakes all in it, their own. Sealing a seepage pond, what you're doing is you're creating a layer of natural biological material that allows for a little bit of seepage, but not a lot of seepage. So water's going to seep through, but it's not going to seep through and just exit the pond or exit the system very quickly. It's a very slow seepage. And that slow seepage can be beneficial or it can be detrimental, depending on how you're looking at or what kind of pond you're wanting and what uses you're wanting. In order to facilitate the sealing of a seepage pond, you're gonna to wanna to put layers. And you can do this semi sort of artificially where you're actually putting in layers and you can put layers of carpet in, put layers of cardboard in. But the trouble with those particular ingredients is you may or may not know what kind of chemicals are integrated into them. If they are going to leach out into your water and contaminate your water, you're not going to want to do that. You want to definitely know what chemicals are in the material you're using. Better yet, why not just use animals? So Seth Holter is a, a German who is world renowned for his permaculture education. He's been teaching people how to make natural seepage ponds for a very long time. And with that, he uses pigs. Pigs will wallow in the lows, and what they do 
their bodies will vibrate. And during that vibration, what happens is all of that lower level stuff vibrates and starts settling. And as it's settling, it creates a compact layer on the bottom of that pond with their manure, with their urine, with um, plant material. And if you have any clay in your soil, it's going to create this really, really thick and very, very compact layer that prevents a lot of the seepage from happening. So that's one way of doing it. If you're not interested in using pigs, you can use ducks. So when you start building your pond, you start integrating that natural form of sealant by integrating the animals into the area. And you can fence them off, you can confine them to that area to make sure that it happens. But using animals, using their feces and their urine and using their bodies that go in and vibrate that ground, compacting it, is, in my opinion, the best way to go about doing it if you're wanting a seepage pond naturally. Now, this is not going to work in all areas. Your soil and your water filtration ability through that soil is going to be a very big determining factor. If you have very sandy soil, you're not going to have a seepage pond. You're definitely going to have to line that pond because you're going to find that all of your water drains out way too quickly and then you're not going to have any water available to irrigate your crops. If you have very clay soil, you're in luck because that's going to work very well. If you have that sandy soil, you can augment clay into that area by adding, my preference would be bentonite clay, but you can add pretty much any types of clays and then add the animals for a natural, more gentle way of creating a pond and creating that biotic layer that's going to seal the pond, only allowing a little bit of seepage, not too much seepage, in order to create your pond. And with all of this, it seals by compaction. So anybody that has done any gardening knows that if you step on it, if you step on your rows, you're gonna compact that soil. It's gonna be harder for the plants to grow. And it's the same concept with the pond. What you're doing is you're really packing it down, but you're doing it in a more natural, gentle way by using animals and natural process. Seepage ponds can be a great benefit for the area. If you find that you're having problems or you're finding that your aquifers are being drained uh, for different reasons. In our area, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of growth happening. So we have less agriculture and a lot more growth. We're having neighborhoods popping up where each neighborhood, all of the people are having their own, their own well for their houses. So you have all of these straws in the aquifer pulling water out and unfortunately that draws from the aquifer to the point that we're finding that our static levels are reducing constantly and once we get to a certain point we're not going to have any availability of water because our aquifers can be just drained down to the point that we either have to drill a new well or find another source but if we were to be able to integrate some seepage ponds throughout the area, and our area is not completely flat, we do have some rolling hills, and that would be ideal if we can get seepage ponds at the top of the hills to allow for drainage into the crops uh, from those seepage ponds. The seepage would also seep down into and refill our aquifer. We're finding that this is the case in many different areas where they're integrating seepage ponds throughout the region and they're finding replenishment of these aquifers. So what they have is a river or a stream filling their ponds, the seepage leaving, but the top or the surface water is watering their, uh, their crops. There's other types of seepage ponds where the seepage, as it's draining into underneath and down from the ponds it's watering underground all of the crops that one is less susceptible to evaporation 
So you're going to find that water stays in the system a whole lot longer. With that also are natural springs. In areas where natural springs used to be and they stopped being, <laughs> with adding seepage ponds, these springs are returning. So we're finding that these seepage ponds are having a very positive effect on the areas, the regions where the seepage ponds are integrated into agricultural communities. So if you look in the lower left hand image on this particular slide, you'll see how in this region, they integrated multiple seepage ponds in the area. And you can see where the water is starting to flow. They put the ponds uphill and allowed for, as, as the, the ground declines, they allow the water to move through the earth in order to um, passively irrigate the crops just above the, the water as it's traveling through. So other than replenishing the aquifer and all the other positive effects, why should we choose irrigation ponds? Well, the most obvious is irrigating your crops. You have access to a water source uh, in areas where you may not have enough precipitation, you may not have enough um, inlet or outlets. You want to store the water when it's available. If a stream is flowing during the spring, but it's not during the heat of the summer, you can create a, an irrigation pond where the stream comes in, you're able to trap that water and then use it later on in the year when it would no normally not be available. A two acre pond can irrigate 30 acres of land. I see that as a huge benefit. So with irrigation ponds, you can capture and store the water when it's available and use it later when it's no longer available. So ponds can capture and store and then later distribute water uh, for a variety of agricultural reasons. Uh, ponds can be used for irrigating crops, uh, supporting other types of agriculture, aquaculture. You can provide water for livestock. So having a pond where you can use that water to pump to where you need it to go or let gravity feed it to where you need it to go for your livestock. So ponds can be naturally replenished through normal precipitation or they can be artificially filled through lakes, streams, or other sources. With these ponds, you can also use them for aquaculture. Aquaculture is the growing of aquatic plants or animals in water. You can have fish, shellfish, aquatic plants. You can grow algae. Now, funny thing with algae is, so I was taking a, a biology course in the master's program at another university when we grew algae. And then we took that algae and we were able to extract a biofuel from the, the growing of this algae. And so that's one of the other things that you can do with uh, agricultural ponds and a double use for irrigation ponds. Uh, in, in other kinds of uh, agriculture, if you are growing vines, such as grapes, you can use this water source as a way to man manage and maintain the environment in, in that little area. Uh, we live one mile from a very, very large lake and we find that our climate is very different where we're at than it is if you drove into the city. In the city, totally different. Uh, during the summer, it's way hotter in the city. It's much cooler where we're at. And so it, with having the lake there, it, it reduces the ability for the climate to get super hot or super cold. And we found this to be true in our area specifically. Uh, being only a mile from the lake, we find that our climate is very different. It is much wetter. Uh, we do have a lot more fog, especially in the winter, fall and winter. Uh, but for crops such as grapes, what it does is it creates this protective shield uh, in that area, keeping those crops from having some really hard freezes. And these, these irrigation ponds can do the same thing. So having an irrigation pond in a vineyard is definitely a positive. So if you're going to have an irrigation pond, where do you put it? Um, 
where you put it is so important. If, if you put something somewhere where it's not going to be good, you're going to have problems. <laughs> Which reminds me, when I was a kid, we lived in an area, it was a small town that was built on marshland. The town was built during um, the drought season, which was quite a while ago, decades ago. The town was being built on this, what used to be marshland, and everybody thought, oh, this is prime farmland now, until the marsh came back. <laughs> so taking the time to understand the environment and the climate over a period of time is definitely going to benefit you. So when they started building this town on marshland, it was fine. And then the marshland came back because we went into more of a wetter season and everyone's basement started flooding. I would get up as a kid, throw my feet out of bed and splash. Tell you what, that will really wake you up. <laughs> So pick the location that's going to be the best location based on observations over time. So if you're looking at new land, look at the historic uh, evidence for how that land has been produced over time, what's been going on with it. And definitely look at the, the slopes and the hills of the land because you don't want to put your pond at the bottom of a hill and have to pump your water all the way up the hill because that's going to take a lot of energy. And if you're looking at the bottom line, wanting a zero on your bottom line, you do not want to put more energy into moving that water than absolutely necessary. So if you can put your irrigation pond at the top of the hill and allow gravity to feed all your crops down the hill, you're using no energy no energy and that right there is a positive and a plus but if your if your land is very flat put your pond in the center because if you're going to have to pump it you might as well pump it to the least distance absolutely possible so if you put your pond in the very center of your crops and you pump outward you're only going half the distance than you would if you put your pond at the very end of your crop and pump all the way across. So being able to pump out and spread or flow would be much better than having to pump all the way across. So take, take into consideration the slope of the land, location of the pond, where it would be most beneficial, least energy consuming, and definitely pick the right location. But how do you build the pond? Well, you start digging and you dig a big hole. I know that sounds simple, but it really is that simple. You start digging, you dig the biggest hole you can for the area that you want, for the acreage of, of water that you're wanting to supply for your crops, and you just start digging. If you have equipment, it'll be much easier. <laughs> I'm not digging by hand, especially in our area. Because in our area, we'll dig about a foot and a half down and hit caliche. Caliche, if you don't know what caliche is, it's nature's cement. Oh my gosh. Let me tell you a story. So we were taking our frost free from one side of the property to the other. Uh, because where it had been located when we first bought the property was not where we wanted anything to be. It was absolutely in the weirdest location and it was so not useful. We wanted to take it out to where our animals were going to be, our crops were going to be, <laughs> so we decided to go get a, a small backhoe from a rental company because we didn't own one. Uh, we actually didn't own the tractor at the time. Uh, this was very early on in, in owning this land. We went and rented this small backhoe and we started digging and we scraped the dirt out and we scraped the dirt out and then we we hit caliche. 
and this little backhoe would not get through absolutely would not get through so we took that one back we got a bigger one we came home and nothing i'm telling you this stuff is absolutely impenetrable if you don't have the right equipment so we went back to the rental company and we got a jackhammer and i can tell you right now anybody that runs a jackhammer kudos to you i don't know how you do it because i was exhausted and then we switched and my husband was exhausted it was the most terrible experience i have ever had i don't wish a jackhammer on anyone so definitely take into consideration and I keep saying all these considerations because you do have to think about them. You have to think about all of the, the ways that you're going to fail or all the ways that you're going to succeed. And in our area, you definitely have to have the right equipment in order to create a pond because you have to get through that caliche layer. Now with the caliche layer, we do have the positive effect of there's no seepage. So we can take that caliche, we can throw in some clay and leave it and be done. There is nothing more that I need to do because the amount of seepage is so minute through caliche that we don't really have to worry about it. So with, with filling the pond, uh, like I told you earlier, Idaho does have regulations where we cannot fill a pond with aquifer water, can't do it. And since we only get eight inches of precipitation every year, that's not going to fill the pond. So we would have to have a surface water inlet from somewhere. So, so you're looking at this two acres of pond per 30 acres of crop. Is that going to cut your revenue? If the answer is yes, and you're not willing to take that risk, then the pond is not for you. If the answer is yes, you're willing to forfeit two acres of pond in order to uh, multi-crop your, your farm by being able to now produce an aquaculture as well as your, your irrigated crops, then maybe the pond is for you. But that's a consideration that has to be made in how much land are you willing to forfeit for a pond in order to irrigate the rest of your crops. So now that you've decided that the pond is for you, you definitely wanna do it, you definitely wanna build it, now you gotta construct it. <laughs> so, do you have the money to do it? Definitely need the money to do it. So, you get, you get your equipment, you dig a really big hole, you decide whether you want the seepage pond or you want a completely sealed pond. You get your equipment, you get all your materials and supplies, and you start building the pond. A seepage pond is going to take a lot longer than a sealed pond, but a sealed pond is going to take a lot more resources. And then you have to decide where you're going to put that pond. So locating the pond in relation to the location of your crops uh, in order to maximize uh, the irrigation availability while minimizing the energy use. Are you going to use gravity feed or are you going to pump the water? If you have hills, then gravity feed is going to work for you. You can basically open a valve, allow the water to flow out, flow through your crops, being able to water everything with no energy at all. However, if you don't have hills, you're going to have to use a pump. So installing pumps for every one of your ponds is going to be costly. Is it worth it? Balancing act. Is it worth it financially? Is it worth it economically? So it's quite a balancing act being able to decide whether you want that many pumps, uh, that many ponds, uh, that much acreage taken away from crops, or are you just going to use the traditional methods of watering your crops? But if you decide that the ponds are for you, maintenance now is a factor. So you've built your pond, you started using it, the first year you're using it, you're pulling water from it, and now you have to maintain it. 
there are a lot of things that can go wrong with your pond and these are the things that you need to take into consideration again consideration when you're deciding whether you want to actually build this pond or not maintenance is going to be a yearly thing because it's not just mechanical maintenance yes the mechanical maintenance is there um, now that you've built the pond whether it be a seepage pond or a sealed pond uh, you're going to have to maintain it and the things that you're going to have to maintain are if you have a sealed pond what if you get a hole in the liner now you have to drain that pond you have to seal the the hole and then you have to fill it back up again but the benefit of that is you can be using it as irrigation in order to drain the pond and then you have to find the hole if you don't know where it is and you have two acre uh, a two acre sealed pond that's a lot of area that you're going to have to cover to try and find where that hole is. If, if you have either a sealed pond or a seepage pond, you're going to end up with algae. That's not going to change. No matter what you do, you're going to get algae. Algae is going to remove oxygen from the water. So if you do have an aquaculture growing in your pond, the algae will remove the oxygen killing whatever you're growing in there. So my pond is a whopping 55 gallons. This is much easier to maintain because I use it to water all of my citrus trees. And my citrus trees being located in the year-round greenhouse require water all year long. So as I pull water from the pond to water the plants, I'm circulating new water into the system. So that keeps the algae at bay, it keeps the fish, uh, oxygen, the water oxygenated for the fish. I also have oxygen being pumped into the tank in order to maintain a higher oxygen level. So irrigation ponds for other uses. What? Yes, you can use your irrigation pond for more than one use. It is the primary use, but we do have other ways of being able to use irrigation ponds that could benefit you in multiple different ways. So as the primary function, the irrigation pond is going to be used to irrigate your crops or your livestock. So you're going to be using that water in order to transport to, to whatever plants that you have or animals that you have. Uh, but if your pond is constantly full because you have some type of an inlet year-round inlet year-round outlet uh, you can use your pond for multiple purposes one of those is recreational so if you have a pond on your property that you're using for irrigation you can also if it's a clean source of water coming in and going out you can use that water as a recreational site uh, swimming ponds so other uses um, are, of course, like we talked about, aquaculture. Uh, definitely use it for, for growing a secondary crop, for balancing, uh, as a balancing act for stability of your business. If you have the ability to produce two completely different types of crops, say peas and fish, then your business can be balanced and more stable overall. My man-made pond is used for the trees in my greenhouse, but I also use it to grow fish. And then I also use it outdoors during the summer as a water source for my compost tea. So I will pull water from the tank and I will place it into my uh, compost tea aerator and I will use that water along with some compost and other materials that I add to it in order to make a compost tea uh, on a bi-weekly basis in order to feed the plants outdoors. But another really good source of use for your irrigation ponds is uh, for gray water. Yeah, you heard me right, gray water. Not to be confused with black water. Do not put your black water in your pond. 
I'm telling you what, you're not going to poop in your pond. But gray water is high in natural pathogens. Uh, these are, this is the water that you're going to use for cleaning your clothes, uh, washing your dishes, washing your hands, showering, um, but not your toilets. Absolutely not your toilets. Uh, but the gray water uh, cleansing method can be used not only on your farm, but it can be used in, in large settings. as as pictured in the image that you're looking at right now, uh, big cities can use uh, ponds as a gray water cleansing, and then that water can then be released into the environment without any worries that it's going to contaminate anything. So you're using plants and you're using rocks and minerals in order to wash the water over and through that environment, and then once it's out, it's clean. I encourage you to look into this a little bit more and see what you can do on your own homestead in cleaning your gray water a more natural and energy efficient way. And with that, uh, we are going to close out on this presentation for ponds. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, and I mean any questions at all, definitely post them below and I will get to them just as soon as I can. So we will see you again next time. Bye.